Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue our study, our look at revival, true revival, what it is, how it happens, and what the effects of it are, all right? Okie dokie. Uh, this is the conclusion of that. This is the fifth week we've looked at this. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're working from the book of Nehemiah. Now, this is not a study of Nehemiah as much as it is just using a, a, that as a framework for looking at what revival is, okay? Mm -hmm. So last week in our fourth part, this is our fifth part today, um, we, were, we were talking about perception and per, you know, paying attention to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay? So we're going to start now. And we're going to be in the seventh chapter of the book of Nehemiah. And as we do, let me just ask, Father, we just pray that you bless our time together in your word, Lord God. We thank you that you have sent your spirit to lead us into all truth. And we know that your son Jesus is the truth. So I pray that we come away from this with a clearer picture, a clearer understanding of your word and your son and your plan in our lives. So we praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So Alice and I want to greet you, speaking of that, in the name of the Lord. Greetings uh, in the name of the Lord, our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. Um, before I start, let me just say this. We are in desperate need of revival. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, in the time of Nehemiah, remember now the people of God had been in captivity in Babylon. Because of their disobedience and their hard hearts, God had sent them off to be corrected to a place where they would once again hear his sweet voice. Mm -hmm. All right? And we talked about the fact that Ezra and Nehemiah are together here. They were, at one time, I believe that they were, it was considered as one, one writing, one book. Mm -hmm. All right? So, Nehemiah was building with, he, he led, they were rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem while Ezra was rebuilding the temple, okay? So, in, verse, in chapter 7, verse 1, let me read that to you, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. Now, when the wall was rebuilt, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Singers? Singers. He knew how to protect yes. with praise, okay? I mean, isn't that the idea of a wall and doors and gatekeepers? Well, to keep the enemy out. To keep the enemy out. And I, I tell you, there's a great truth here underlying this, mm -hmm. that praise will keep the enemy yes. out, okay? Yes. When we praise, then God goes forth and does the battle. That's what it says, I, Isaiah 42, uh, verse 10. That's right. So the, the fact of the matter is, it says that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Yes. Satan doesn't really want to come into contact with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, that's why he tries to get us separated from the Lord so we are easy prey. But that's the point. The wall was rebuilt, and what he's doing now is setting it up for protection. Mm -hmm. And in, in verse 2 it says, Then I put Hanai, my brother, and Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, in charge of Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So now, this is the man that he chose to be the commander of, of the fortress in charge of Jerusalem. He was faithful. These are the things that commend him. He was faithful and feared God more than many. You know, the fear of the Lord is not something you hear a lot about in the, in the church today. No. And yet, I, just look at Proverbs, for example, okay? In Proverbs, uh, in verse chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's right. Yes. In 8.13 in Proverbs, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. In chapter 9, verse 10 of Proverbs, it says, That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In chapter 10, Psalm goes on and says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life. In ver chapter 14, verse 26, he says, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence, and his children will have refuge. In Proverbs 23, 17, it says, 
Do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Now, this is not as in the Middle Ages at points, the church was kind of teaching that you be you need to be afraid of, of the no. Lord because he's just looking for an opportunity to bonk you on the head. No, that's not what this is about. This is about holding God in reverence and awe. Okay? So think of these words now in relation to what we're talking about. God spoke to the prophet Isaiah about, and he's speaking of Jesus, the coming Messiah, when he said, I'm reading from Isaiah 11, right, starting in verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes sees or, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. That awe, that reverence of God the Father. And, you know, there was an effect in the early church. Because in the book of Acts, in, in chapter 9, verse 31, it says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. Want to increase? You want, you want, you want to see the church grow? Let's try some fear of the Lord, hey? You know, there's <clears throat> the word awesome. That people just banter about. Banter about, yes. I mean, every, I mean, the stupidest things are awesome, but that word belongs only to God. There's no other, no, nobody else should use that word to describe anything when you're talking about God. That's His word. Because to come into contact with God yes. will make you have awe. That's so true. stop you. That's you know, so all right? Yeah. Fear in the heart of the worldly person brings anxiety and discomfort, right? I mean, that's what fear does. The fear of the Lord in the heart of a believer brings the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Well, isn't that what that isn't that what it just enacts? Right. The fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they go right together. Okay, because when you are when you're walking in the fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit will be there constantly giving you that grace and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me go back to the book of Nehemiah here. In chapter 7, verse 3, it says this, Then I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are standing guard, let them shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint guards from the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each at his post and each in front of his own house. I would say one of the things, when, it, when something is rebuilt, when there's revival, mm. you better protect it, and you better be on guard, mm. okay? Because the enemy is going to come against it. So I want to talk about that a little more. Mm -hmm. So, But we have to, in order to protect and guard what God is doing in, in our lives and in the church, we have to be of sober spirit, be on the alert. For our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's 1 Peter 5, 8. Satan, he's the adversary. He wants to come and destroy the works of God in your life, in the church, and in your life. You know, Leonard Ravenhill, and I talked about him, I think, once or twice already in this study, because he was so, such an, had such a heart for revival. And was so in tune with the Spirit of God. He's done a lot of writing. He did a lot of writing on it. And But he said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. Oh, that's true. <laughs> if, I mean, I'm not talking about putting a sign out in front of your church building to try and make that church congregation grow bigger. I'm talking about true revival. If you, have, if you don't have a heart for it, if you're not really hungry for it, you're not going to see it. Think, think about these verses. Let me go back to Peter again. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says this. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We should long for the word of God like a baby longs for pure milk. 
Well, I don't know. I mean, what happens when a baby is hungry for, for pure milk? They'll scream and holler, and they'll go. They'll let, I mean, you, know. They'll let you know, and they're not going to. They're not going to quit doing that until they're they're satisfied. Do you hunger for the word of God like that? That if you're if you don't have it, you're not you're going to scream and holler until you're satisfied and have it. Think about David when he wrote in the Psalm, Psalm forty two one, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. What kind of hunger do we have for God and the things of God? Why haven't we seen revival? I'm talking about real revival in so long. Well, I think Raven Hill hit it right on the head. I, I don't I don't think we're hungry enough for it. So, but I'm going to tell you, regardless of that, revival is going to come because it's the promise of God. Okay. Ready so, or not. Ready or not, here it comes. Amen. Because, because he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's coming back for a bride that is restored. Mm -hmm. So he's going to bring revival. No doubt about that. But now let's, let's just take a look at the results and the requirements of revival. Okay? Mm -hmm. there, are, there are both. I mean, when there's a revival, you know you see the results. But there are also requirements. So now I'm going to read from chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. There was unity. Yes. You want to see? That's one of the first things you're going to see in revival, true revival. In verse 1, it says, And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. They gathered as one man. There was true unity. If we're not seeing, if we don't see unity in the body of Christ, don't think that there's been revival. Okay. In verse 3, it talks about the fact that they had a hunger. Having been revived, they had a hunger for the word of God. And he read from it before the square, which is in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to this book of the law. I'm telling you, they'll teach you in seminaries today. You can't speak for more than 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That's right. All right. These people, when they were revived from early morning till midday, they were they're just because that's that hunger for the word. You know, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 16, he said, Thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the light of my heart. Is God's word the joy and the light of your heart? If it's not, you've not been revived. You're not, you're not feeling revival in your own life. Verse 6, it says that they bowed low before the Lord and worshipped him. Good order was restored. Okay. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You know, Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants you to be that people of worship. Why? Because we hold him in awe. Yes. Okay. That's the result. That's a result of a revival. Mm -hmm. Is this true worship. And I'm telling you, so much of the church doesn't understand worship. No, not at all. I mean, you know, I had the opportunity to spend a year teaching all over the United Kingdom about this two people who were involved, quote-unquote, in worship ministries, right? Yes. And saying, worship is not a slow song. You know, praise is the fast one and worship is the slow one. Worship is giving unto the Lord the thing that is most precious to you. The first place it's used in Scripture is when, I, when Abraham was told by God, I want you to take your son, your only son, up to Mount Moriah, right, and offer him as a sacrifice. And he did that. But when he was going up to the mountain, he told his servants who were below, he said, we're going up to worship because that's worship, giving to God the thing that is most precious to you. And the thing that's most precious to you should have come from the Lord. It's not something you dreamt up or started, okay? We need to become that people of worship. And if there is true revival, worship will be, I'm telling you, the most, the most obvious characteristic. All of a sudden, it's not going to be about us. It's not about what we're getting. It is about our heart to worship the Lord God. 
then the next thing that'll happen with revival has to happen with revival is that there's going to be joy. Yes. In verse 10, it says, Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fruit, the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is a fruit of that whole, of the Holy Spirit. But before the joy, they were weeping. So there was repentance. Yes. So the repentance would lead to joy. Repentance would lead to joy. It says weeping may last for the night, but joy, but cometh, joy in cometh in the morning. morning. And I'm telling you what, when when you have a heart for God, this is what I was talking about. How, how much do we hunger? Yes. And absolutely hunger. Newborn babe crying out, crying out because he does, he's not satisfied. He wants more of the milk. Are we like that with the Word of God? We want more and more of the Word of God? That should be our prayer. More of you, Lord. Lord. Because you, if you, that's your prayer, you will be satisfied. Yes. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. They found written in the law, it says. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Is verse 14. Verse 14. So, yes, we, we have to be in the word of God. Those who, I mean, I, this couldn't be any more clear. In John chapter 8, Jesus said that if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, he's saying if you live in my word, mm. you're truly my disciples. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Free from the burdens of life, free from anxiety, free from fear, free all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he came to set the captives free, but he does it through his word and through the ministering of the Holy Spirit. So, so they've, they've done all of this. Now they're in the word. In verse 16, it says, So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim, Nehemiah 8, 16. What? They read it, they heard it, and they went out and did it. Mm -hmm. you, if you, you, know, you can hear the word all day long, but you're, if you're not a, a hearer, you can be a hearer of the word, but if you're not a doer of the word, you're going to be ineffective. You're going to be, it's going to be all futile. You have to learn to be a doer of the word. That's revival. This is revival. When all this is going on, that's true revival in your life. But now revival that comes has to be nourished. You know, God caused man, put him in the garden to cultivate. When God has given us this gift, mm -hmm. we have to learn to cultivate it. Revival has to be nourished. How? Nourished on the bread of life, the word of God. That's what we're talking about, right? The word. Or it'll starve to death. Well, that's how we nourish our spirit. That's the it, it, it is sad to see if you study revival, how many revivals have started and just simply seem to have petered out. Okay, now obviously the enemy is going to come against them, but it has to be nourished or it'll die out. Okay? If, I, if you want to do your own study, I mean, go do a study on, look at all the revivals that have taken his place historically, even in the last few hundred years. And yes, there have been great revivals, but then they seem to die out. Why? They have to be fed. They have to be cultivated. They have to be nourished. Signs and wonders. Now, here's the problem. I think a lot of people think that the mark of revival is signs and wonders. Now, signs and wonders will often accompany true revival, but that alone will not sustain revival. Signs and wonders will not, they're not going to sustain or nourish revival. Think about what Jesus said in Matthew 12. I'm going to read verses 38 to 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
As a matter of fact, religious fervor that's fixed on signs will likely be transformed into something akin to the entertaining magic mm. of Simon the Magician <clears throat> in Acts, in the book of Acts. Yes, yes. In Acts 8, I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. It says, so there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what's called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. Jesus said that the sign that will be given is the sign of Jonah the prophet. True revival will always have a foundation of the word of the cross. Always. always. Except no counterfeits. True revival is always linked to a broken and contrite heart. Think about what Isaiah the prophet said, all right? Please, please hear these things and pay attention. Isaiah said, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on high and a holy on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Isaiah fifty seven fifteen. The lowly and contrite, that's where revival happens. Okay, that's what signs and wonders. That's great, but that's not what feeds. No, it's you know, not, yeah. Those... What ha what happens if there's a great revival and there's no signs and wonders, except for broken and contrite heart to see see people bowing down and worshiping God, weeping and wailing, be, in a joy of repentance. Because not the signs and wonders people have for. Ages, they've seen miracles, they've seen God do things, but well, it hasn't brought them to a place of repentance. Well, I think we're living in the perilous last days, and I'm going to tell you something. In the perilous last days, Satan's going to come along and do signs and wonders, yes, and many will be deceived. Even had the time not been cut short, even the elect, right. right? Let me just recap a little bit. Mm -hmm. The reason for revival, renewal, and reformation is restoration. Yes, that's yes. that's the purpose of it, okay. Mm -hmm. Restoring you into the image of him who has called you. That's God's purpose and plan, all right? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8, 29. God made man in his image. Then man sinned. Didn't look like God anymore. God's purpose was to take a people and bring them back to that image of God, okay? That's a whole study on its own. But the fact of the matter is, that's the goal of it. Mm. Not just to make you more cheerful, mm. to make you more Christ-like. Not to make you happier, to make you more Christ-like. Mm -hmm. Not to make you famous, but to make you Christ-like. It's got to restore, and pay attention to this, please. True revival will restore the sovereignty of the Father. Mm. It will restore the lordship of Jesus Christ, and it will restore the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's what true revival does, okay? And the reason for revival is this. I'm going to read, you from, read to you from Psalm 119, verse 88. Revive me according to thy loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of thy mouth to make us doers of the word of God. Faithful witnesses to the world of God's word, right? Right? In, in Nehemiah, there's kind of an epilogue. I'm just going to jump up to verse chapter 9, verse 38. And in Nehemiah, it says, Now because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. The only problem was they didn't keep it. So Nehemiah had to go back to Jerusalem from, okay? Think about 
please think about this. We just talked about it a minute about guarding, okay? Guarding. Guard, it's that yes. guards. Second Timothy 1.14 says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You've got to guard this. Beyond God. No soldier on active duty entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. This is warfare. It really is. Revival turns things upside down. Mm -hmm. Or rather, more correctly, right it turns things up. right side up. Okay? Mm -hmm. It takes comfortable, complacent, and casual Christianity. It takes Christians, those Christians, from their traditions, connected to self-made religion, as Paul talked about writing to the Galatian, uh, Colossian church, when he said, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. How much of our religion is self-made religion? Okay, revival takes us to a place where we go from, you have heard it said, mm -hmm. to hearing the voice of Jesus saying, but I say to you. That's what he said over and over in the Sermon on the Mount. Revival will not happen without stirring up the enemy, both within and without. You've got to be aware of that, right? When Elijah was sent back to, into the Holy Land, now remember he, when there was a drought, he had yes. been out right, for three, three and a half years. So he gets back to Israel. God tells him, okay, it's time to go back. I'm going to bring rain to this parched land. And he was met by the king of Israel, Ahab, who called him the troubler of Israel. I mean, this is God sending for revival to restore things to its proper place. And the first thing that happens is the king of Israel meets him and calls him the troubler of Israel. And as Elijah was preparing the altar on Mount Carmel for that miraculous sacrifice, mm. this is what he prayed. This is from 1 Kings 18, verses 36 and 37. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Yeah. Revival, turn their heart back again. That's what happened on Mount Carmel. God revived the people. He turned their heart back. That miracle, that fire from heaven, was followed by a battle. Yes. All right? The destruction of the prophets of Baal. But the fight wasn't over. The real danger was and had been Jezebel, mm. the queen of Israel, who supported the false prophets, the enemies of God. And yet, centuries after, centuries after, mm -hmm. right, Jesus Christ wrote to the church, the church of Thyatira, and there was still a Jezebel who was still an enemy of God, and his people were still tolerated, and, and his people still tolerated that enemy from within. Jesus said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And Peter wrote, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. I'm going to tell you, that, that ends our study on revival. But what I'm going to do is next week, we're going to do a, a special study about these destructive heresies that are being introduced from within the body of Christ. I'm, I'm going to call this a look at a study on a clear and present danger. Because I do believe that these are the last days. That we're living in the last days. And there is such an attack on the people of God. And it's coming from within and in the, the quote-unquote church. We need to be on guard. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have sent us your spirit to lead us into all truth, Lord God, and truth is what we desire. Lord, help us to have our hearts and minds set upon you. 
and to stay fixed on you, to fix our eyes on your Son, Christ Jesus, Lord. So we praise you and thank you that you would keep us true to the end. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you until next time.